Well, good morning, Southeast. It is great to see all of you here today. Great to be seen by those of you who are on Facebook Live and who will be joining later on on YouTube. Uh, it is wonderful to be in the house of the Lord together on this first Sunday of Advent. And our opening scripture is found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 9 through 14. Excuse me, verses 9 through 13. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, beginning at verse 9. How can we thank God enough for you in return for all the joy we have in the presence of our God because of you? Night and day we pray most earnestly that we may see you again and supply what is lacking in your faith. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus clear the way for us to come to you. May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else, just as ours does for you. May he strengthen your hearts so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus comes with all of his holy ones. Let us pray. Father, we are so grateful to be gathered together in your house today. We thank you for your presence in our midst. We thank you for putting upon our hearts to join together, to be together in your presence. And we pray that in this time that you would be honored and that you would be glorified and that you would accomplish your work within our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And I invite you to stand and to join in song as we begin the Advent season.
Amen. You may be seated. And again, it's great to have all of you here, um, especially giving thanks today for the good Thanksgiving dinner that we had Wednesday night. Thank you for all those who helped in so many ways, uh, whether in terms of baking pies, uh, roasting turkeys, uh, giving towards it, uh, being here to help serve, to help set up, to help tear down, just all the different ways we had so many people helping and just giving thanks for each and every one of you. And thankful for the event. Uh, I think we had maybe about 75 or so people come out. I don't know how many plates of food we dished out, um, but it was a wonderful time together. And so just thanking the Lord for everyone's participation. Uh, we also want to remember uh, Brother Tony Curtis. He's recovering from knee surgery this week. And so we lift him in prayer. We also lift up Richard Larima in prayer. Uh, as he deals with some health issues and I know that there are others who are struggling with health and so we just want to pray for God's blessing upon us in terms of health and I know there are other requests and some who are grieving and so we're going to go to the Lord in prayer in just a moment our psalm that we'll open our prayer time with is psalm number 25 and so if you would turn with me there to Psalm number 25, I know some of you are thinking, wait a minute, I thought we were further ahead than that in the book of Psalms. Um, but we're following the lectionary during the season of Advent. And so the lectionary Psalm is Psalm number 25. And so I'll go ahead and read this and uh, aloud, you're welcome to join me. And if you have the New International Version as your translation, if you have a different translation, just follow along. Uh, but Psalm 25, and then I'll pray, and we'll close with the Lord's Prayer together. So Psalm 25, let us begin. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. In you I trust, O my God. Do not let me be put to shame, nor let my enemies triumph over me. No one whose hope is in you will ever be put to shame, but they will be put to shame who are treacherous without excuse. Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths, guide me in your truth, and teach me, for you are God my Savior, and my hope is in you all day long. Remember, O Lord, your great mercy and love, for they are from of old. Remember not the sins of my youth and my rebellious ways. According to your love, remember me, for you are good, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in his ways. He guides the humble in what is right and teaches them his way. All the ways of the Lord are loving and faithful for those who keep the demands of his covenant. For the sake of your name, O Lord, forgive my iniquity, though it is great. Who then is the man that fears the Lord? He will instruct him in the way chosen for him. He will spend his days in prosperity and his descendants will inherit the land. The Lord confides in those who fear him. He makes his covenant known to them. My eyes are ever on the Lord, for only he will release my feet from the snare. Turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am lonely and afflicted. The troubles of my heart have multiplied. Free me from my anguish. Look upon my affliction and my distress and take away all my sins. See how my enemies have increased and how fiercely they hate me. Guard my life and rescue me. Let me not be put to shame, for I take refuge in you. May integrity and uprightness protect me, because my hope is in you. Redeem Israel, O God, from all their troubles. Amen. Let us continue to pray. Our gracious and holy Father in heaven, we are grateful to be in your house, to be in your presence. And we acknowledge that we are here because of you that you're the one who awakened us this morning, that you're the one that put it within us to be here and to worship you. We thank you, Father, for your faithfulness. And as the psalmist prayed, Lord, we lift our hearts to you. We trust in you. And we pray that you would show us your ways and that you would teach us to walk in your paths and that you would guide us in your truth and that you would teach us, Lord, to know you, to serve you, to follow you in all things. And again, I think of those words of the psalmist. Oh, we confess our sins to you. Oh, we pray that you would remember us not according to our sins, but according to your great love that you have shown us in Christ Jesus. 
Lord, you are so gracious to us. You are so loving. You are so faithful. Lord, we experience your love in so many ways. One, just in being alive, that you're the one who created us and you created us out of your love and out of your goodwill. And none of us are here by accident. None of us are here by mistake. None of us here are here by chance. But we're here because of you, because of your great love. You brought us forth into this world and, and gave us life. And we thank you for that gift this morning. And we thank you that in your love for us, you created each of us with purpose, that we might glorify you and that we might reflect your love to one another. Lord, help us to do that, we pray. And then, Father, in your great love for us, you stay engaged with us. You didn't just create us and walk away. You didn't abandon us, but you are constantly engaged and you are faithful to us each day. Thank you, Father, for the way that you provide and care. Thank you for places to lay our head. Thank you for the way that you give us rest. Thank you, Father, for food, for clothing, for the way that you protect us and shield us from this world. And thank you, Father, especially for how you hold us together that when everything would seem to come undone and we wouldn't know which way to turn, yet we can always turn to you and you hold us together and you keep us going. And so we're grateful for your faithfulness each and every day. And then, Lord, we're especially grateful for the love that you showed us in sending your son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. And we do confess our sinfulness to you today. And we confess that we fall short of your glory. And we pray, Lord, that you would change our hearts, not only forgive us, we're grateful for that gift of forgiveness, but even more, we pray that you would transform us and that you would make us more and more like Jesus to where we trust you wholeheartedly, holding nothing back from you, but living in complete obedience to you. And then, Father, we pray also that in that obedience, you would increase our love for each other so that your love just transforms the way that we treat each other, the way that we care for each other, the way that we respond. Lord, we think about how Jesus responded to people, always out of love, taking in curse but returning blessing. And we pray, Father, that you would make us like that, that we would be so full of your love that no matter how we might get squeezed, how we might get pressured, that it's your love that would come out. And we pray that you would help us to imitate you rather than to imitate those who do us wrong. And Father, we pray for those that you have blessed us with, who teach us your ways, who help us to follow Jesus more closely. Lord, we are grateful. Each one of us have people in our lives like that, and they help us to know you better. And so we're so thankful. And then, Lord, we pray that you would use us that way towards someone else. We admit it's so easy to get self-consumed, self-absorbed, that we don't see other people. We don't think about other people and how you might want to use us to minister to them and to draw them unto Christ. We pray, Lord, that you would set us free from being trapped in self-pity, set us free from being prisoners of our own ambitions. Uh, Lord, set us free from that to where we might be able to see each other and respond to each other through your spirit, compelled by your love. And Lord, we bring all of our praises and our pains to you. And again, Lord, I'm just thankful for this Thanksgiving, for the meal that was able to be served Wednesday night, for all those who provided in so many ways, Lord, just grateful today. And then, Father, I want to bring to you those who are struggling with health issues this morning. Uh, we pray, Father, that you would be near to Brother Tony Curtis, that you would touch his knee, that you would bring about complete healing and restoration and be with him through the rehab process. Give him strength for each day. Be with Brother Richard Larima. Lord, keep your hand upon him through these challenging times. Uh, increase his faith and increase his peace. And then, Father, we pray for others that are unnamed today that are dealing with health issues, uh, some chronic. It just seems like they won't go away and that there's no healing. We pray, Father, that you would bring healing. And we pray that you would bring strength for each day and peace for the journey and joy for the journey. And Lord, we bring everything to you. We pray for those who are brokenhearted this morning and who are grieving today, uh, the loss of loved ones or broken relationships. Lord, we bring to you and we pray for your healing. We pray for those who are facing difficult times in life and really aren't sure which way to turn except to turn to you. And we pray, Lord, that you would draw them near to you and that you would give guidance and direction for at least the next step, if not the whole, if not the whole way. 
And Lord, we ask that you'd be with those who are on the streets today and those who have loved ones on the streets today. The brokenness that's there, we pray that you would bring healing. We pray, Father, for those who are incarcerated today and the families of the incarcerated. We ask, Lord, again, that you would redeem the time, that you would bring healing and peace, and that you would bring homecomings. And Father, we lift these to you. We know that this can be a kind of a, a difficult season for many, um, even a dark time for many. And we pray, Lord, for each of these that you would redeem the season and that there would be a fresh awareness of the joy that comes and the hope that we have in Christ Jesus, our Savior and Lord. And Father, we think about our not only our city, not only our state, our nation, but the world. And Lord, we see so many problems, so many places, and so much that's wrong and not right. And we see such leadership at so many levels acting in self-interest instead of the interest on, of, of those that they're charged to be responsible for. And Lord, we just see it through and through in so many ways. We pray, Father, that you would minister to our leaders at all the different levels and that their hearts would be turned to you and that they would seek you and that they would serve humbly. And Lord, we pray that you would impress upon each of them a fresh awareness that they're in power in order to serve, in order to care for those for whom they're responsible. And Lord, only you can bring about such a shift in mindset, but Lord, we pray for it at every level. And then, Father, we pray that you would be with us, your people, your church, gathered here, across the street, up the street, downtown, all parts of the globe. Lord, we pray that you would help us to be a people that truly does seek you first and seek your kingdom and help us to live according to your lordship in our lives. Grant us your spirit that we might be faithful witnesses to you and to the salvation that you've accomplished. And we pray, Father, that the world around us, again, wherever we are, that the world around us would see the hope that we have in Christ. May that hope be especially evident as we move through this Advent season and the truth that you're coming and that our redemption is near and that you will restore all things. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Well, just a couple of announcements today. Uh, one, as usual, the offering plates are in the back, and you are welcome to give your offering at, at any point. And just thank you for your faithfulness and giving and for the Lord's blessing. And then also thank you for those of you who give online, those of you who mail your offering in or drop it by. Uh, we're just praising God for your faithfulness. And God blesses, God is good. And then second announcement, uh, this Saturday is men's breakfast again. And so, yeah, I hear an amen or a woohoo back there. And so men's breakfast Saturday morning, 8 o'clock. And if you want to help cook, get here around 7-ish, uh, but breakfast at 8 and then Friday night, we are going to decorate the church a little bit more. And so you can see it's partly decorated, but we want to string up Christmas lights on the outside and uh, get more decorations up outside. And so Friday night is part of our, as part of the table ministry, the meal will be at six, but we'll also be decorating, stringing lights, that kind of thing. And then there's also going to be some cookie decorating. And so Sister Vaughn is going to bring some cookies and that are undecorated, maybe even unbaked. <laughs> We're still working that out, but there's going to be cookies and there's going to be decorating take place. And where there's cookies, there has to be coffee and maybe even some milk. And so you don't want to miss out on Friday night here. And uh, I think those are the those are the main announcements. Now, this is the first Sunday of Advent, so let me go ahead and explain Advent a little bit to you, and I know that I'm off camera here for those of you who are looking at uh, Facebook, my apologies for that, but here we have the, you want to try to reload this, please? Yeah. We have our roving reporter. Okay. Okay. okay, so I think we're on it. So anyway, so this is the Advent wreath, quite beautiful, maybe the most beautiful we've ever had and thank you to those who helped with that so you'll notice that we have candles 
And there are three purple candles, one pink candle, kind of on the exterior of the wreath. The purple candles symbolize the royalty of Jesus, that Jesus is king. And each week we will light a candle as we approach Christmas, uh, symbolizing that Jesus the king is coming. And his kingdom is getting brighter and brighter. You'll notice that one of the candles is pink. The pink candle stands for joy. And so it's a kingdom of joy rather than a kingdom of tyranny and oppression. And then you'll notice that the candles are placed within a wreath. And so the, the symbolism of the wreath is that it's an everlasting kingdom. It's a kingdom without end. Okay, it's not a term. It's not a, a, a period of time. It is without end. And you'll also notice that the wreath is made especially of evergreen. Not only is it an everlasting kingdom, but it is a kingdom of light. And so the evergreen, everlasting light, the pink candle, joy, the joy of Jesus' kingdom, his reign, the purple candles that he is king, and then the white candle in the center, that's the one that's lit on Christmas Eve. And that's referred to as the Christ candle. And so this morning, we are going to begin by lighting the first candle. And I've asked Bryce to come, and he's going to light candle number one. And Brother Beto is going to come, and he's going to read one of our Advent scriptures from Jeremiah chapter 33, verses 14 through 16. And so, Brother Beto, if you will come and read, and Bryce, if you will come and light this first candle as Beto reads. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the good promise I made to the people of Israel and Judah. In those days and at that time, I will make a righteous branch sprout from David's line. He will do what is just and right in the land. In those days, Judah will be served, will be saved, and Jerusalem will live in safety. This is the name by which it will be called. The Lord, our righteous Savior. Amen. 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 All right, I have a question for you. And the question for you to consider today is this. How do you keep from going crazy? <laughs> okay, what advice do you have? How do you keep from going crazy? All right, well, I was a little bit worried at first because I didn't hear anybody talking. And so I was thinking maybe nobody knows how to keep from going crazy. Uh, the way I keep from going crazy is, one, don't watch the news. Two, don't drive. And three, don't watch sports. Okay, especially the Chargers. Okay, our scripture this morning uh, for the message is found in the Gospel of Luke. So, Gospel of Luke, chapter 21, verses 25 through 36. So, Luke, chapter 21, verses 25 through 36. And just a little bit of context here. 
uh, Jesus is speaking about ultimately his return. And the word Advent means to come. And so during this season, we anticipate not simply Christmas and the coming of the day when we celebrate the birth of Jesus, that he came as a babe in a manger, but we also anticipate the coming of Jesus again as Lord, as Savior, as triumphant, as King, reigning over the whole of creation and bringing about redemption and restoration for all of creation. And so right now, we're kind of in between the times. We're kind of in this overlap of ages, if you will, to where Jesus has already come and he's already de defeated death. He is resurrected. He's already defeated sin. He never gave in to temptation. He was obedient to the Father all the way to the cross. And so victory has already been won, but it's not worked out in terms of its completeness. That there's still a lot of pockets, if you will, in the world where there is resistance to the reign of Jesus. And sometimes we find those pockets in our own lives as well, to where there's this resistance to the lordship, to the reign of Jesus. And we certainly all recognize that we are still under a death sentence, that barring the return of Jesus, we're all going to face death one day. And so we recognize that while Jesus is risen and he's Lord, yet his kingdom is not yet here in its fullness. And so we're anticipating Jesus' return and establishing in his kingdom in its fullness a day of resurrection, a day of complete redemption. And so our passage, passages throughout the Advent season, are passages that kind of direct us to that hope that we have of Jesus' return and the full establishment of his kingdom uh, to where there's complete redemption of all creation. And so today we look at Jesus' teaching about his return. And so let me go ahead and read the passage, and then we'll set the context up a little bit more and begin to take a look at what Jesus is teaching here. So Luke chapter 21, beginning at verse 25, and this is Jesus' teaching. There will be signs in the sun, moon, and stars. On the earth, nations will be in anguish and perplexity at the roaring and tossing of the sea. Men will faint from terror, apprehensive of what is coming on the world, for the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. When these things begin to take place, stand up and lift up your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. He told them this parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. When they sprout leaves, you can see for yourselves and know that summer is near. Even so, when you see these things happening, you know that the kingdom of God is near. I tell you the truth. This generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Be careful or your hearts will be weighed down with dissipation, drunkenness, and the anxieties of life. And that day will close on you unexpectedly like a trap. For it will come upon all those who live on the face of the whole earth. Be always on watch and pray that you may be able to escape all that is about to happen and that you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your faithfulness and for your ministry amongst us already. And we pray as we turn to these words of Jesus that you would give us ears to hear and hearts to be receptive and minds to be obedient and that you would accomplish your will amongst us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So our context here is that Jesus has been teaching at the temple. Uh, he has come into Jerusalem riding on the donkey. He has overturned the tables. They've questioned him about where he gets his authority from. He's questioned them. He's been teaching them. They've had this kind of back and forth dialogue going for a few days now. And in chapter 21, Jesus looks up and he sees how the wealthy are giving their gifts. And then he sees a widow who puts in two coins. 
And nobody thinks anything about that except Jesus. And Jesus teaches his disciples in that moment and those who are there that, look, she has given all that she has. The others are just giving out of their abundance. They still got a lot left. But the widow, she's giving everything that she has to live on. And then the disciples are kind of impressed about the wealth of the temple. What a magnificent building structure it is. And Jesus tells them, hey, this thing is coming down. That there's not going to be one stone left upon another. And so Jesus at this point is kind of prophesying that the temple is going to be destroyed. And the disciples hear this and their question is, when? When is this going to happen? And see, when Jesus talks about the temple being destroyed, it's not like any building being torn down or destroyed. When the temple is destroyed, when Jesus is announcing that, it's almost like Jesus is announcing end times. That everyone would recognize that the, this kind of judgment on the temple being torn down, being destroyed, not one stone left upon another, that that would somehow signify that God was bringing about an ending. So their question, you know, when is this going to happen? It's not like maybe our question of, you know, when are gas prices going to go down or when's this going to happen or that going to happen? Their question, when, is really an, kind of an end times question. And Jesus catches that and Jesus knows that. And so Jesus begins to answer their question. And he will talk about a destruction that is coming on Jerusalem. Not the world, not the end, but a, a judgment coming upon Jerusalem where Jerusalem will be torn down. And what a terrible time that that's going to be. And most would say that the time that he is predicting happened in about AD 70 when the Romans came and they tore down the temple and they tore down Jerusalem. And Jesus goes on to say, okay, but that's not the end end. And that you're going to go through a time where there's going to be persecution against you. And that people are going to betray you and people are going to turn, your in, turn you in. But he's, he's saying, hey, don't worry about that. You're going to be arrested and you're going to be on trial and you're going to stand before kings and governors. And this is all just an opportunity for you to bear testimony to me as your Savior and Lord. And sure enough, we see that happening across the ages. Okay, and, and so Jesus is, is kind of talking about the end, but he's not being maybe as specific as they would have liked, nor is he being as specific as sometimes we would like. But he's talking about the end times and destruction and judgment and persecution of believers. And he also has this phrase, the time of the Gentiles. And this would kind of foresee that the gospel is going to go forth amongst the world. That it's not just about Jerusalem, that there is a judgment, there is persecution, but there is also a time for the gospel to go forth that Gentiles might be able to hear the good news and to turn and believe in Jesus and receive salvation. And so then finally, he gets to our passage. And our passage is more about the end. And you'll notice that all through chapter 21, including our passage, that there is no date that's given. Okay, and we know that no one knows when. That that's also part of the teaching of Jesus. That no one knows the date of his return, only the Father and so Jesus doesn't give a return date. He gives some signs. He gives some things that are going to happen along the way. But the emphasis is not on date. The emphasis is on certainty. That Jesus for sure. Jesus for reals. Jesus absolutely is coming again. And because of that, there is also kind of a twin emphasis on being prepared that because he is coming how shall we live how shall we be prepared 
So that's kind of the emphasis of, of the section and kind of how this whole thing holds together. So if you, if you were getting excited thinking that I was going to tell you when Jesus is returning and when the end is the end, I'm sorry, you're going to leave disappointed. Okay, but the certainty is that he is coming and that we need to be ready and that we anticipate his coming. Now look at the, the passage that we opened with here in terms of the, the teaching of Jesus. So verses 25 through 27 and 8 and on down here. There are cosmic signs. So look at verse 25. There will be signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars. On the earth, nations will be in anguish and perplexity at what? At the roaring and tossing of the sea. Men will faint like they're going to stop breathing from the terror of it all apprehensive of what is coming on the world for the heavenly bodies will be shaken now i don't know everything to do with this but it's huge it's cosmic it involves the whole universe so think with me for a moment way back to genesis 1 in the beginning when god created the heavens and the earth and think about some of the things that took place in genesis 1 that on day four, God created the sun, the moon, and the stars. And do you know what their jobs were? The job of the sun was to govern the day. The job of the moon, the lesser light, was to govern the night. The job of the stars was to kind of govern the seasons. So you have sun governing the day, moon governing the night, stars governing the season or seasons what happens if they start falling it's chaos just absolute chaos that God's created order is turned to chaos when you think about the seas roaring and tossing okay what did God do in creation God gathered the seas so that the dry land appeared and so that there were shores there were borders to the sea and so that you had the dry land where life could live and so what we're seeing here in these kind of cosmic signs is the breakdown of god's created order okay are you tracking with me now i don't know the best way to understand this but i think i have a clue that the reason why the created order is breaking down even at the level of the sun governing the day the moon governing the night the stars governing the seasons the seas being kind of gathered together so that you have the dry land the reason why everything is kind of breaking apart and turning chaotic is because of the sinfulness of the human race and that the sinfulness of the human race begins to reach such a level that it is beginning to, to mess up all of creation. And so that the chaos in our lives becomes so chaotic that it begins to create chaos in God's created order to the extent that it's affecting the heavenly bodies and that everything is turning upside down a mess. Okay, part of why I think this is because of the pattern that I see throughout Scripture. That if I think about the flood, that the reason why the flood came, the reason why God sent the flood, is because the corrupt way of humanity corrupted all flesh. Not just the human race, but all flesh. Because our job here, and you'll hear me pray it week in and week out, our job here is to reflect the character and the goodness of God out into the world. We are to reflect his image to each other and to all creation. And so when we act violently, when we act corruptly, we are reflecting out a false image of God. And what that does is that messes everything up. And so you tend to live and imitate your God. 
And so if all of creation is beginning to think that God must be violent because we're reflecting a violent image out, then you have violence upon violence and all creation is messed up. And so all I can think is that what is going on here is that at the end, humanity will be so corrupt, so sinful, that our atrocities have reached such a level that God's created order is feeling the damage, feeling the pain. And so that it's chaotic everywhere. Maybe another way to think about this, not a super good illustration, but in the front of our house, we have some facial boards off the roof. And when we put those up there, we got a drip edge up there, but there's one place where kind of the drip edges come together and overlap a little bit. And I don't know how, but water kind of seeps through that. And we don't have that much rain uh, and, and dew in the morning, but water kind of seeps through that. And the facial board, it's painted, you know, it was, it was done right. And yet over time, between the heat of the sun and the water that somehow gets between the cracks of the drip edge, what happens is that paint begins to deteriorate. And then the water begins to kind of soak through that paint and into the wood, and the wood begins to deteriorate. And so finally it's at a point where sometime here in the next season or so, Bond is thinking sooner than later, that I need to get up there and cut out the part that's bad and replace it so that it's whole again. Okay, what happened? How did that wood that was protected actually go bad? It was that constant drip whenever we have a heavy dew or whenever we have a heavy rain to where it went bad. I kind of think that maybe that's a way to look at what's going on here. That you have this kind of constant drip of the sinfulness of humanity against the order of creation. And it drips and it drips and it drips, and sometimes it's heavy, and sometimes it's just from the heavy dew, but eventually, it's like that board gives way, eventually, the order of creation is going to give way. And that God will use that to bring judgment upon us for our sinfulness. And Jesus is saying that when you see these kind of cosmic disasters beginning to take place, that those are the signs of the time. Listen to it again. There will be signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars. On the earth, nations will be in anguish and perplexity at the roaring and tossing of the sea. Men will faint from terror, apprehensive of what is coming on the world, for the heavenly bodies will be shaken. God will do the shaking but as God does the shaking, it's part of how God created things in terms of the sinfulness of humanity kind of dripping and dripping and dripping till everything begins to give way. At that time, they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. When these things begin to take place, stand up, lift up your heads, because your redemption is drawing nigh. I don't know exactly what that's going to look like. But the idea is that, that when everything is giving way, and everybody is going crazy because it is giving way, and everybody knows that it's giving way, that that's when you're going to see Jesus, the Son of Man, return. And notice he's returning on a cloud coming from heaven on a cloud and the cloud power and great glory on display. Now this is going back to Daniel chapter 7 verse 13 where Daniel has a vision in the midst of incredible turmoil, in the midst of incredible chaos and evil. He sees one like a son of man coming on the clouds of heaven, gathering together God's people and bringing salvation. 
And Jesus is, is pulling from Daniel's vision and saying, look, this is how you're going to know. When everything's falling apart, you're going to see the Son of Man talking about himself coming on a cloud, power and glory being revealed. I can't help, especially with this word redemption that gets used. I can't help but think about how God led the Israelites out of Egypt. Remember, he was over them, a cloud. And the cloud separated them from the Egyptians. And the cloud is what kind of led them through the wilderness. And the cloud settled upon the temple and dwelt there in their midst. And so they had this cloud that was kind of fiery at night and provided protection in the day. And so Jesus, you know, coming on this cloud of God's presence and God's glory to gather his people. And so when everyone else is going crazy and fear of, of the end and afraid to face the end, Jesus says, what? Lift up your head. Lift up your head because your redemption is near. Your Redeemer is coming. And redemption to save you, redemption to bring you through this, redemption so that you're part of the new creation. And so, yeah, you're under a death sentence, but that's not the last sentence. Redemption in terms of resurrection and a part of that new creation that Jesus is bringing. Dee, what, is your, what did your dad used to say? When everyone is losing their heads, make sure you keep yours. Okay, Pastor D's dad had a lot of sayings. Okay, and that's one that has just stuck with me that D has passed on to me. That when everyone else is losing, your, losing their heads, make sure you keep yours. I would like to tweak it a bit. That when everyone else is losing their heads, lift yours in hope. Because you know that your redemption is near. You don't lift your head in arrogance. You don't lift your head in kind of self-confidence. You lift your head in Christ confidence. Knowing that Jesus is coming knowing that Jesus is your redeemer, knowing that Jesus has defeated all things, and knowing that because of the victory of Jesus and your trust in him, that you will be redeemed and brought through it and made new. Conquering death, just as Jesus did. So when people are talking about the end, and when people are talking about, do you think these are the end times? And people are starting to get scared. And they're watching the news and they're looking at the economy and that they're looking at leadership locally to globally and feeling like, man, everything is just coming undone and starting to go crazy. Don't you go crazy. Don't you lose your head. What are you supposed to do? Lift up your head because you know that your redemption is near that your Redeemer lives and he is coming and he will see you through. So, so hold on to that. Let's go a little bit further. Jesus gives them a parable. He tells them it's like the fig tree and all the trees in the springtime, they get their leaves. And when you see trees starting to bud in the springtime, you know that summer is coming. So look at verse 31. Even so, when you see these things happening kind of the chaos of the world and all the different things that Jesus has been talking about in chapter 21. Even when you see all these things happening, you know it's not yet summer, but summer is near. And so when you see these things happening, you know that the kingdom of God is near. Kingdom of God, yes, it's already come in the ministry of Jesus, but it hasn't come in its fullness yet. And so when you begin to see these things happening, you can lift up your head in hope and confidence because you see, you know, that these are just signs that the kingdom of God in its fullness, it's near, it's at hand, that in due time, it'll be summer. 
that Jesus will bring it in completion. We go a little further. Verse 34. This is where he begins to kind of refocus on how we live in these times. Be careful or you're, oh, I'm sorry, I skipped 32. So he, he says this, I tell you the truth, this generation and generation, you might have a footnote there in your Bible. It could refer to race. Uh, it could refer to a 40 year span. It's a very fluid term. And so don't get too hung up on the word generation. Um, I tell you the truth, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Okay, we don't know how best to understand that. Some would say that he's talking about that generation of people in front of him. Others would say that he's talking about, you know, the word generation is kind of, I don't know, kind of telescopic in terms of generation upon generation upon generation upon generation. So you could think of it that way, that this generation and all their generations. And some would read it more in terms of this generation, in terms of the children of Israel, the, the Jewish people. So however we take that, it's really not the issue. The issue is the certainty of the coming of Jesus. I tell you the truth, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Heaven and earth, they're going to decay. They're corrupt. They're going to pass. They're going to be buried, if you want to think of it that way. An ending. But there's no ending to the power and the truth of Jesus' words. And so heaven and earth may pass away. Yes, endings are coming. But my words, forever. You can bank on them. Be careful, or your hearts will be weighed down with dissipation, drunkenness, and the anxieties of life. And that day will close on you unexpectedly, like a trap. For it will come upon all those who live on the face of the whole earth. Be always on watch and pray that you may be able to escape all that is about to happen and that you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. Let me talk a little bit about this. Uh, hearts weighed down, heavy hearted, but heavy hearted with what? Dissipation, drunkenness, and the anxieties of life. Now, dissipation is not a word that I normally use. And so trying to think about this word dissipation and kind of think, okay, what, what in the world is dissipation? Basically, if I were to kind of translate this into modern vernacular, it's the word wasted. So it's the effects of drinking. It's the effects of doing drugs. It's the effects of all kinds of stuff. And so that you are basically wasted. And so... Don't be wasted. Don't give way to drunkenness. Don't give way to the anxieties of this world weighing your heart down. And at one level, Jesus is talking very literally. And so don't give in to drunkenness and the wastedness that comes from that. And don't let drunkenness be the way that you deal with the anxieties of life, of getting high, getting drunk, in order to somehow escape the reality of the pain of life, escape things that you have to deal with. Don't, don't let drunkenness become your solution to the anxieties of life because all that's going to do is leave you wasted. Okay, so literally he's talking about it that way. And you know and I know that that's one of the responses that we too often make when we start to feel anxious about life that we're trying to deal with the anxieties of it. And you know that, as well as I do, that this season, in terms of Christmas and its expectations, in terms of the end of the year, that this season can create a lot of anxieties. What's our approach to them? And Jesus is saying, don't be so weighed down with the anxieties of this life that you turn to some form of self-medication, whether it's alcohol, whether it's weed, whether it's something else, don't turn to that stuff. Okay, because what's that going to do? That's just going to result in you being wasted. 
So don't give in to that. But I think he's also talking not only literally, but also kind of metaphorically. That we can become intoxicated with the pleasures of the world. And we can also become intoxicated with the anxieties themselves. And so that because of the anxieties or because of being consumed, we think we're consuming pleasure, but instead the pleasure ends up consuming us and we end up wasted. And Jesus is saying, don't don't go down that path. Don't let yourself go down that path. Don't be consumed by the anxieties of the world to where you end up wasted in one form or another. Instead, what are we to do? We're to be careful. We're to guard our hearts. We are to look at verse 36. We are to always be on watch and pray so that we may be able to escape, make it through all that is about to happen when everyone else is losing their head. When everyone else is going crazy, when everyone else is consumed by the anxieties of everything falling apart and they just end up wasted, we are to watch and pray so that we'll be able to escape and we'll be able to stand. I want to go with the word to stand to help us better understand to escape. Because sometimes when we hear the word escape, we kind of think, okay, it's all going to happen around me, but it won't happen to me. Okay, but you know and I know that that's not quite reality. That crazy stuff doesn't happen around us. Crazy stuff, hard stuff also happens to us. And I'm just looking across the congregation and I know story after story after story about how hard stuff has happened to us and not just around us that we haven't escaped it okay so what kind of escape is jesus talking about here well i think the key is the standing that as we watch and pray we'll be able to escape so that we may stand before the son of man that we can face jesus And the only way that we can face Jesus is if we're faithful. This past week, we had class on Tuesday. I think at least half my students, well, actually a little bit more than half, I don't think they realized we had class on Tuesday. They kind of took an extended Thanksgiving break. So I had a little bit of fun in the roll call. And so normally I take roll every class and You know, I I see where they're at, and I'll say, you know, they're here, they're here, they're here. You know, somebody's not here. So this week, this past week, when I took roll, my word was faithful. I called their name. I see them sitting in their desk, and I pronounced faithful. And then I called somebody's name. I knew they weren't there, but I was still going to call their name anyways, and their desk is empty. And you know what I said? Unfaithful. (laughs) I had a fun time taking roll. (laughs) Declaring who's faithful and who was unfaithful. I think that's kind of what's going on here. That the escape is not somehow avoiding troubles as much as it is avoiding troubles unfaithfulness that in the midst of the troubles in the midst of everything going crazy in the midst of the anxieties of life not consumed by them because we watch and we pray and we turn to Jesus and Jesus help me through this Jesus help me to stay faithful through this Jesus help me to respond as you would respond Jesus help me to live in the hope that I have because of you rather than giving way to being controlled by the fears because of these crazy, chaotic circumstances. Jesus, help me to stay true to you. 
And we'll be able to escape. We'll be able to make it through by his grace, by his power, by his presence, so that at the end, when he comes, we can stand. And we can hear something like, faithful, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter the joy of your master. Enter into the kingdom and the fullness thereof. Faithful, you can stand. See, that's the escape that we're watching and praying for. It's not somehow, it's not somehow, I don't know, getting out of it as much as it is getting through it. Trusting, faithful, not being consumed by the anxieties of life, not turning to some form of intoxication so that we can numb the pain or we're caught in the high and our lives are wasted. No, we're going to escape all that. We're going to be brought through all that as we watch and pray so that we can stand. So as we enter into this Advent season, when everyone around you is losing their head over the craziness of our times and fear about what's happening, fear about what might happen, fear about the latest virus strand, fear about the economy, fear about political leadership of all different persuasions, fear about global issues. When there's all this fear and everybody's wondering, is this the end? Or the anxieties that are produced by it is consuming them to where there is intoxication, to where there is numbness and waste. When all that's going on around you, when everybody is losing their head. What are you supposed to do? Lift up your head. Not in arrogance, not in pride, but in confidence and the hope that we have in Christ that Jesus is coming and that our redemption is drawing near. And so we watch and we pray. We keep our eyes on Jesus and we pray. Grant us your spirit that we might live faithful through all of this. Give us the power to stay faithful, to remember the hope that we have in you so that we're a hopeful people rather than a fearful people. And we know that our redemption is near and we'll be able to stand and hear those words, faithful, well done, good and faithful servant. So today we are going to close with communion. Advent, the first Sunday of Advent, is actually the first Sunday of the church calendar. So church calendar starts with the first Sunday of Advent. Our secular calendar starts January 1. So I figure what better Sunday to begin having communion once again than the first Sunday of the year. I know this is the only, well, the church is the only place where this is the first Sunday of the year, but we're going to do it. And so Pastor D is going to pass out the communion elements. If you would like to receive, just kind of flag Pastor D down and he will pass them out. You can see that his hands are sanitized and so you don't need to worry about catching anything. And uh, as he passes them out, uh, just wait till everyone is received. Uh, Charlene, Vonda, Alex, if you would come and if you would lead us in um, uh, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. Uh, our Advent song for today. And if you would lead us in that, if you want to sing along, I believe it was number 171 in your songbook. And then just flag Pastor D down and then hold on to your cup and the bread that's in it. And then we'll take communion together.
pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the hope that we have in Christ Jesus, our Savior, our Lord, our Redeemer. And we pray that you would give us the grace to stay faithful, to stay true, no matter how crazy or chaotic things get around us. Help us to know that that's just an indicator that Jesus is coming, our Redeemer is coming, and that our redemption is drawing near. Empower us through your spirit to stay faithful and true to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, these things, you got to pull the top off, and then you should have a, a little piece of bread right there. Uh, those of you who are at home, you're welcome to get your own bread. Um, but you have this little piece of bread, and then there's a second thing to pull off, and that takes you down to the layer of the juice. And we celebrate communion not only remembering that Jesus gave himself for us, but also an anticipation of his coming again. And so this meal is a reminder of that first coming, but also of his future coming. On the night that our Lord was betrayed, he was gathered with his disciples celebrating the Passover meal in the upper room. And he took the bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take and eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. And in like manner, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take and drink. This is my blood, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. And could we just sing that chorus again, maybe a couple times? Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall Now may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the love of God our Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit go with us all through this week and empower us to live in the truth and the hope that Jesus is coming. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 God bless. Have a hope-filled week. And don't lose your head.